Hello there and welcome to Compass. Tonight a story that goes to the heart of what it means to be Catholic in the 21st century. For a number of years now, the Roman Catholic Bishop of Toowoomba has been under sustained pressure from the church's highest authorities in Rome to resign. Well, finally last month, Bishop Bill Morris was forced into early retirement by the Pope. The reason was not sexual misconduct or financial mismanagement, but apparently for raising issues deemed off limits by the Vatican. So through the eyes of the man at the centre of the storm and others who oppose him, here now is the story of what happened and why. Bishop Bill Morris is facing an uncertain future. On May the 2nd, he was ousted by the Vatican after 18 years as the Bishop of Toowoomba. I've heard him and I've called him myself, he's a straight shooter. That um, where the truth is, he's not afraid to say it without fear or, or favour. Known and loved in his diocese, He's now a cleric without a cause. I think what Bishop Morris did wrong in Rome's eyes was not only to consult everybody in the diocese, especially the laity, but he took them seriously. You probably had the same reaction as I did. Catholics around Australia are shocked and angered by the Vatican's heavy hand. In Toowoomba, there have been protests, a candlelight vigil, and some have threatened to leave the church. There are certainly some people who feel so strongly that, that the formal church, through its uh, hierarchical structures, has simply made such a terrible decision that they can no longer support a church uh, that has done that. I think the Pope did make the right decision. It's a shame that it has ended up such a scandal where such a lot of good people are confused and hurt. So what has Bishop Morris done that so upset the Catholic Church? We may need to be more open towards other options for ensuring the that... The catalyst Eucharist was this solid. letter he wrote and sent to his parishioners in 2006, addressing the shortage of priests. As has been discussed internationally, nationally and locally, ideas such as ordaining married, single or widowed men welcoming former priests, married or single, ordaining women, married or single, recognising Anglican, Lutheran, uniting and church orders. This letter triggered a five-year fight with Rome that ended with his forced removal from office. He's just moved to Brisbane, where I caught up with him to find out more about this unprecedented turn of events. Bishop Morris... Do you believe, in effect, you've been forced to retire over your readiness to discuss women priests, ordination and the ordination of other orders, or do you think it's over something more broad, uh, something broader? What do you focus down on yourself? Um, I think it's broader in the, in the sense that um, I, um, I was asking questions... Um, I, um, because I was asking, I, I think this day that um, it's difficult to ask questions because you've asked questions, they, they would much prefer you say to um, just say, fine, you know, um, just do what we want you to do, do what you're told and so on. Are you disappointed in the Pope's response? The Pope has every right um, because, of, because of his role um, and because of his authority um, to do, you know, to do, to ask me to step down and so on. But my, but my... Um, my disappointment lies in the fact that um, I didn't have a dialogue. You must be quite angry about all this uh, because you've refused to participate in the normal procedures which would have seen you take a nice orderly retirement. I've got no anger. Um, my, my sadness lies with, say, uh, people whose lives kind of have been hurt by these actions and so on, and, the, and, my, and my diocese and so on. So that's where, that's where my sadness lies. But I have no anger. I have a, I have a thirst and, and, and probably an urgency and a, and a passion uh, for the voice of the church to be heard. It's not only my opinion today, but I believe it's the opinion of many others, that there is a creeping centralism, there's a creeping authoritarianism, there's a creeping infallibility that's coming in, say, in the context, say, of the church, the hierarchical church, and, say, the, and, and the people. And, 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 I, and because of that, 
it's, I believe it's stopping dialogue. It's stopping the movement of the spirit. Take this mitre as a symbol of your call to preach and to teach the word of God to all. Since his consecration in 1993, Bill Morris has put his stamp on the Toowoomba Diocese. He's made changes in liturgy and the government of the church. He broke with tradition, choosing to dress in a business tie rather than the Roman collar. But it's been his willingness to promote discussion with his priests and people which has been his undoing. Are you resolved to be faithful and constant in proclaiming the gospel of Christ? I am. Bishop Morris, at his ordination, publicly promised to support the Pope and to support the teaching of the Catholic Church. That hasn't been done. The schools in his diocese are getting worse, not better. From my own experience, the first half of my children went to Catholic schools. The second half have gone to the state schools because they were not being taught what the Catholic Church teaches. Bishop Morris strikes me as being a quintessentially Australian bishop. Loves people, gregarious, will do anything to see that his job as leader within the community has done well. Deeply pastoral man and a man who was willing to listen to people and promote conversation. And uh, I think that might be somewhere near the nub of the problem with Rome. So what is it in Bill Morris's background that made him the bishop he became? He was born in 1943 and grew up on the Gold Coast and the Brisbane suburb of Cooparoo. I had a very happy childhood. It was mum and dad and my sister. I can never remember my parents telling me to do something. I can only remember my parents asking me to do something and then allowing my sister and I have opinions and to discuss. And uh, we were mass going people, uh, went to church on Sundays, we, we, we prayed at home, we went to Catholic schools, Dad uh, helped the sisters at, uh, at, in, around the place and so on, helped the priests. So we, we were actively involved. Uh, Jesus w wasn't a stranger, he was very much part of our life. Bill Morris entered the seminary in 1963 at a pivotal time. The Second Vatican Council had just opened. Its mission, to reform and bring the Catholic Church up to date with the modern world. When Bill Morris was ordained a priest in 1969, he was at the forefront of the changes that swept through parish life in Australia. My first parish was at Sunnybank with Father Tom Hegarty, who was given the task in the Archdiocese of Brisbane to educate the Archdiocese with regards to the Vatican Council. So for my first three and a bit years of priesthood, after I left the seminary, being exposed very well through the professors for the Vatican Council, I had this man who was a giant in the context, say, of his knowledge of the Vatican Council and also his theology, uh, to walk with that and to be open to that. You're a true child yeah. of Vatican II. I was immersed in it. And do you have any sympathy uh, with people who worry that there were some downsides to Vatican II, such that they unravelled some core rituals and practices and beliefs that did bind the church together? I, I, I do. Um, you know, like, I think there's a conservative movement in the world today, which is fine, um, because I think that, you know, oftentimes we could, we could have gone too far in some of the ways that when, when the Vatican Council finished, we went... Shoo, and I think we could have gone too far to one way and, and um, too far the other way and we're trying to seep back to the middle again. I think it's when we get back to the middle is when we're going to get that balance. So, so, but there's a home for everybody, but it's a matter, say, of everybody respecting each other and being able to listen to each other. Lord Jesus, you raised the dead to life... In the Bishop Spirit. Morris's Lord tensions Jesus. with the Vatican go back more than a decade to controversy surrounding the use of a ritual called the Third Rite of Reconciliation, otherwise known as General Absolution. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. 
This allows for communal confession of sins rather than one-on-one -on -one confession with a priest. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. The third rite became a popular form of reconciliation after the Second Vatican Council. In fact, more recently in the last 20 or 30 years. And uh, the people loved it and came in droves to celebrate it. A lot of people didn't want their children to have a one-to-one -to, -one to priests, you know, in country areas where you say you've got small communities. People didn't want to go along to their local priest because he knew too much, you know, he knew, their, he knew them and they didn't want to go there. So there, there, so there were various reasons, moral reasons and moral grounds and, and sensitivity grounds why, I say, this, this sacrament is just so good uh, in certain circumstances and so good pastorally. But there was growing concern in Rome that this and the relaxation of other church practices in Australia were diluting Catholic doctrine. In 1998, the Vatican issued a set of rules for Australian bishops. The Statement of Conclusions, as it was called, banned the use of general absolution. This illegitimate use, like other abuses in the administration of the sacrament, is to be eliminated. There was a view taken by those who are responsible for the discipline of the sacraments that the ordinary way to celebrate the sacrament of reconciliation is individual confession and absolution. There would be certain exceptional circumstances where the third rite or a communal celebration of the sacrament with general absolution might take place and there's much discussion as to precisely what those circumstances were. The bishops, and not only Bishop Morris but other bishops in Australia, explored that. In 1998, uh, the Vatican authorities explained quite clearly that some had gone further than the discipline allowed. But in the Toowoomba Diocese, Bishop Morris explored options under church law for its continued use. The people, you know, just loved it. And so I... Was, so I, I um, um, thought, well, you know, I'll keep this conversation going because it's of the importance of it. As part of this process, Bishop Morris surveyed his parishioners and put his findings in a report to Rome in 2004. And what did the Vatican officials say? They didn't like that. And I said, I'm not giving them a vote. I said, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm finding out, you know, I'm trying to find their voice. I'm trying to find the voice of the spirit in the context, say, of the local church, which they do have a voice, the sense that, uh, as the Vatican Council tells us, the people have a voice. And if I'm not speaking for them, in, in, just in this particular area, well, then they're not going to say, uh, and um, they're not going to be heard. Their voice isn't going to be heard. You but were a renegade. I was, a, I was yes, a renegade, but I was, giving, I was giving too much responsibility and authority to the local communities. I was enabling, and that's why they said my pastoral plan was defective, because I was, ena I, was, I was enabling the local communities to have a voice. I was enabling the communities to take up ministry. I was enabling the local communities not only to have responsibility, but also authority. Not downplaying the priesthood, but allowing the priesthood to be part of that community, part of the ecclesial ministries of the local communities, so that they would work together in a model of cooperation, in a model, say, of collaboration. Bishop Morris's pastoral plan was designed to meet the needs of a diocese in crisis. Spread over 500,000 square kilometres, the Toowoomba Diocese is home to 67,000 Catholics. Today it has 30 active priests servicing 300 church communities, compared with 80 priests 30 years ago. But the point is you're facing here what I presume uh, bishops across Australia are facing. We are. Huge distances mm. yeah. and declining numbers of priests. Mm. That's right. That's right. And, and um, that's why we needed, say, to have a look at a diocesan pastoral leadership plan to see how we could operate. The tiny town of Jandawi, two hours' drive west of Toowoomba, is a case in point. It hasn't had a resident priest for more than 10 years. When Compass came here in 2008, its pastoral leader was a nun, Sister Mary Cleary. 
My prime duty, I think, is the pastoral care of the people in the parish, and that involves visiting them in their homes, visiting the retirement village, going to the hospital when I'm needed. It involves um, conducting baptisms, funerals when necessary. But the one thing Sister Mary can't do is say Mass. It's been replaced with what's called a service of worship in the absence of a priest, or SWAP. In accordance with Vatican guidelines, there are Bible readings and Holy Communion, but no consecration. For some people, I guess they don't see the difference, but there is a big difference in not having the consecration. So the priest, when he comes for Mass, consecrates enough hosts so that next Sunday we have, are able to have communion because basically that's what people come for. Sister Mary Cleary has since retired and the parishioners of Jandawi now run the parish on their own. There's no question that these are very difficult challenges, particularly in rural Australia with shrinking populations in country areas. But any resolution of those challenges has to be within the framework of settled church doctrine. In 2006, Bishop Morris issued the pastoral letter which was to become the catalyst for his forced early retirement. The letter invited ideas from clergy and laity on ways the diocese might address the priestly shortage. Given our deeply held belief in the primacy of Eucharist for the identity, continuity and life of each parish community, we may well need to be much more open towards other options for ensuring that Eucharist may be celebrated. But what set the alarm bells ringing in the Vatican were its references to the ordination of women and the recognition of clergy from other Christian denominations. Pope John Paul II had explicitly forbade even any discussion of the ordination of women. You must have known that. But I wasn't inviting them to discuss the ordination of women and I wasn't inviting them to discuss um, uh, uh, um, members of other orders, you know, recognising their orders. What I was saying, look, you know, I said we need to be creative in our conversation and we need to be creative in such a way that, you know, these are some of the things that are being in the ferment of the world, you know, they're, they're being talked about. Do you think on reflection you could have worded it better in order to save yourself all this trouble? I think I could have, yes. And I, I mentioned that in one of my letters to um, Pope Benedict, saying that, you know, yes, I, I recognise the fact that um, it could have been worded better because it, it's, it, it's been misinterpreted and I think at times deliberately being misinterpreted um, um, and used against me. Catholics are discussing the ordination of women. Frequently I come across it. Now, I'm not going to get up in a public forum and discuss the ordination of women for the reason that I'm not going to go down the path that Bill Morris went down and provoke a confrontation. But it's entirely understandable and entirely reasonable that people in a Western democracy where there's freedom of speech and freedom of the press want to talk about this thing. What is the problem with speaking about it? I don't agree that those discussions on married women and um, recognising other orders are going on at a parish level. Those discussions have been made in the past and have been very clearly set out as absolute no-goers. I am convinced that the mistaken anthropology is at the root of the failure of society to understand church teaching and the true role of women. Discussion of the ordination of women has been off limits since 1994, when Pope John Paul II declared the church had no authority to ordain women as priests. Whether this is an infallible teaching of the church, that is, the Pope's authority from God on matters of faith and morals, has been debated ever since. It would take us much longer than we have in the confines of a program such as this to go into all of the issues on the interpretation of the church's understanding of the infallibility of the Pope. We'll leave it to the theologians to fully explore exactly what the Pope meant by that statement.
A month after Bishop Morris issued his infamous pastoral letter, the Vatican requested his presence in Rome to meet leading cardinals and bishops. He resisted. So the Vatican sent a theologically conservative archbishop from America to Toowoomba to investigate. Let's talk about that visit by the Archbishop of Denver, mm. Arch Archbishop Chalput, I think his name is. Uh, Charles Chaput. What was your relationship like with him? How much did you have to do with him? It was a very personable uh, relationship. Um, he asked me certain questions, I responded to that. But overall, the three and a half days he was there, um, I drove him around a certain section of the diocese. I was going to take him right out to Quilpie, but he said it was too far to go. And basically, well, he was more interested in seeing kangaroos and emus than he was anything else. So, so I got him to see kangaroos and emus too. During his visit, Archbishop Chaput also interviewed parishioners in the Toowoomba Diocese, including Terry Burns, who'd put her concerns in writing. Dear Bishop Chaput, the diocese is certainly a mess. How much of this is due to the bishop or cathed or the priests or past and present seminary leaders, I don't know. If we did get a good new bishop, God help him. Some good priests here have died and the remainder either have no backbone or are the bishop's men. I can't see things improving in Toowoomba unless you found a superman or managed to get a strong archbishop in Brisbane at the same time. I will keep you in my prayers, as I do all bishops and priests, as their job is so hard. Goodbye and God bless. He went back and wrote a report and said... Do you know what's in that report? Never seen it, no. I've asked to see it, but I've never seen it. Five months after Archbishop Chaput's visit, Bishop Morris received the first of five letters from the Vatican insisting he resign. Each time, Bishop Morris refused. Instead, he asked for a meeting with the Pope, which eventuated in 2009. So what happened at this meeting with the Pope? It was myself and uh, um, Archbishop Wilson. Uh, we went in, and basically it was a monologue. Um, from the Pope? From the Pope. He asked me, he asked me, did I want to say anything? And I said, well, I'm here to, you know, to, first of all, to listen to you. And so the Pope just, you know, focused on the fact that I was um, teaching um, these things to my people, uh, ord uh, ordination of women, uh, recognition of, of uh, orders of and other denominations. I said I wasn't, I wasn't teaching. What honestly did you think, and it's just your impression, the Pope thought of your responses? I don't think um, the Pope was listening to me at all. Um, I, I think they'd made up their mind that they wanted to move me aside because I'd been a bit of a thorn in the side. I've asked questions. I'd, um, um, I, I'd given the people probably a freedom to talk when they didn't want that freedom to talk. A significant part of this whole process was the arrival of a letter uh, to you from Pope Benedict at the end of 2009. Yes. And I think there's a particular paragraph you feel quite strongly about. Could you read it for us, please? It said in the letter, um, the Pope said to me, uh, canon law does not make provision for a process regarding bishops. So in other words, there's no easy dispute settling procedure no. when it comes to bishops. No, none at all. And that the Pope has the, has the right to hire and fire. That's right, that's right. And, I, and I'm not debating... Well, well, he does, doesn't he? Does. He does, yeah. And I'm not he has, anyway. Yeah, and I'm not debating that. What I'm saying, the fact is that, that you know, that um, there, is no, there is no process by which the voice of a bishop can be heard and say, you know, this is what I'm being accused of. Um, I think you've misunderstood what I'm saying. I'm not saying these words. You don't get a day in court, as it were. You don't get a day in court. There's no advocacy. The 2009 letter from the Pope renewed the Vatican's request for his resignation. It also left no doubt that the Pope regarded his predecessor's 1994 declaration about the non-ordination of women as infallible. The late Pope John Paul II has decided infallibly and irrevocably that the Church has not the right to ordain women to the priesthood. So the infallibility there is an interesting one because it's never been used before in an official Stop. You mean no one's ever put that word, word. to what John Paul said That's when he right. said no more conversation? That's right, yeah. yeah. John Paul basically would have used the word uh, as a definitive teaching, which is different from infallible. Uh, definitive meaning fixed, uh, irrevocable kind of thing. He believed.